Yes, this is actually my first time at X-World as well, and everything's been going over my head in, a, in the best kind of way, where I'm actually learning a lot. So uh, hopefully I can contribute something to you today as well through this presentation. Um, my name is Judith Klein, and I work at the Centre for Learning and Teaching at Auckland University of Technology in New Zealand, and I'm also a couple of weeks out from finishing my master's degree, which is also exciting. But earlier this year, at the end of January, I received an email. Hey, do you want to go to Fiji for 10 days? What do you say to that? Uh, but rather to be a bit more specific, it was, do you want to go to rural Fiji on a project to roll out iPads to two schools? Uh, so that required a bit more thought. I was signed on to this project to support both the hardware, the preparation of everything on the ground before we left, and to set up a training plan for the teachers, and then to actually go over to Fiji and implement the setup and the training plan once we were there. Kind of a general all-round technical wizard. So there's lots I needed to learn before we went as well, because uh, I'm not from a sysadmin or IT background. We had other people in my department who were more familiar with that, so we, did, we weren't going in completely blind. Most of the sessions at this conference are targeted at sort of larger scale deployments, and we all know how device management is supposed to work in a perfect world. You can supervise or manage devices, every app and setting is at your command. In iOS 8 this year, coming later this year, that will also include content from the iBook store, so that's another, it's, it's perfect. Um, with the device enrollment program that there's been a lot of talk about as well, you can get the devices shrink wrapped in the box, go through a setup process and they're enrolled as soon as that process is done. It's all very magical. So this wouldn't be a very interesting presentation if it was the perfect world scenario. It was very different from that. So in the presentation I'll talk about the details of the technical setup, and deployment, implementing that setup on the ground, and the challenges, the many challenges we faced deploying iPads and managing them in this context. First of all, a bit of background on the project itself. The Digital Learning Room is a project by Rotary that aims to address the issues of uh, the digital divide by bringing technology to places that would otherwise be technologically excluded and with the aim of improving education for students and giving them better job prospects when they leave school and even leave Fiji or even the island. The plan was to set up two of these digital learning rooms at, on the rural island of Taviuni in Fiji at two of the high schools there. That was based on a site assessment done last year. So we knew some details going in, um, but there was still a lot we didn't know. Rotary had the idea, the business plan, the people on the ground, and the funding. They approached my department at AUT for support on the technology, the deployment, and the teaching. So that was where I came in, because I had experience in all these areas, most of these areas. As you may have guessed, this isn't going to be your typical iPad deployment talk. And it's more about why the rules that we hold true and dear sometimes just have to go out the window. And by rules, I generally mean the things that we accept are the correct way to do things and the rules as laid down by Apple. Given the nature of, the given the nature of this conference, it is more focused on the technology side, um, but because there are a lot of people from universities and schools here, if you are interested in the education side, you can ask questions at the end, I should have left enough time, and, uh, or you can grab me after. I'm not an advocate for breaking the rules, and um, so this project did require a lot of problem solving that required breaking the rules at times. And many of these problems are things that would have had an easy solution in the perfect world in, or in a perfect education or enterprise environment. So what I post to you during this talk is more a way to think about creative problem solving. When resources are limited, you have to think creatively. First up, why iPads? The, I, don't know if I'm preaching to the right kind of audience here, but like we, we all love and work with iPads in my department. And even though the original plan was to go with the cheaper alternative, the main reason iPads were chosen were because of the entire ecosystem. The end-to-end -end control over the deployment environment, access to things such as MDMs and the volume purchasing program, 
And the other reasons why we know and love the devices is reliability, ease of use, long battery life, and generally higher quality of apps available through the App Store. I'm also an app developer, so I tend to wear that hat sometimes, inevitably, so that might come through at times in the talk. So each school was to get 35 first-generation iPad minis, 16 gigabyte Wi-Fi only. What else? To complete the setup, each school also received a Mac Mini server, an Airport Extreme, an Apple TV, a large display, and all the other assorted cables and dongles. There was one very obvious challenge straight off the bat. Everything on the island of Taviuni runs off diesel generators. Therefore, electricity is not the most reliable. A tablet computer, in general, will have a longer battery life, so originally eight projects would have been focused around taking, tap, uh, taking laptops, and so which is why anything like this, they are shifting more towards tablets, so they can actually last a good amount of time without charging if, for whatever reason, there, is electric there isn't electricity available. And, but obviously, the rest of the hardware, if electricity goes, it goes with it. Similarly, with the internet, we were prepared for the worst case scenario, was that there wasn't going to be any, or that would be slow and unreliable. So, and additionally, if, in, if the power goes out, with it goes the internet. We had two devices for each classroom set that did have 3G, but the rest were Wi-Fi, so that was another fallback we had planned. Uh, we found actually the mobile data available there was not too bad, and actually sometimes better than what we have in New Zealand. Um, <laughs> Go figure. This was our basic setup. Uh, don't need to worry too much about reading the little text. The, essential, the basics of it was we had the Airport Extreme creating a wireless network that all the devices, including the Mac Mini, were connected to. Uh, therefore, networking between the devices was still possible. They could still talk to each other. The iPads could still mirror to the Apple TV, and the local files system, the local file system could still be managed. The reason for this was because Obviously, 16 gigabyte iPads fill up really quickly, and they were being used as shared devices. So if you picked up an iPad, it wouldn't necessarily have all the same content on there that you had previously. Uh, so a very basic file management system was set up where uh, file sharing was enabled on the Mac Mini, and the iPads had the WebDAV Nav app on it, and we tried to get as many apps as possible that had WebDAV integration. So they, could, they were able to read and write files from Mac, save things, and retrieve them. We also investigated the possibility of setting up an LMS, such as Moodle, but that didn't quite happen in the end. We also made sure that all the apps we sourced didn't rely on internet access. Again, in my app developer hat on, I have a whole other spiel about apps, but that's for another time, so again, talk to me later if you're interested. We dealt with a huge raft of issues when it came to apps, and most significantly, most significantly the fact that, as it turned out, there is actually no volume purchasing program available in Fiji. It's only available in certain countries, and later we found out that Fiji is not one of them. Um, with any aid project, you are battling a limited budget. And after scouring the app store in search of appropriate apps for their curriculum, so that's the other thing, is uh, at AUT we were used to finding apps suitable for, it, for higher ed context, and then suddenly we were given their curriculum and we we're trying to find apps more suited for high schools. We quickly found that, especially given the limited budget, there, there's a conception of you can easily load it up with lots of free apps. So in the original budget, there wasn't any consideration for apps. And of course, what we quickly found was that the apps that were free weren't good, and the apps that were good weren't free. And so we found a lot of things that looked a bit like this. And Often apps that were free didn't, simply didn't work, uh, they, they weren't very user intuitive, or they prompted you to upgrade every few seconds. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this wasn't the best thing. Uh, we ended up getting a bit of a budget for apps, but this was when the rules really started going out the window. Against our better judgment, we ended up doing what is actually pretty common in, in many schools, but we all know it's wrong that we cloned one copy of each app across all the devices for a single app ID for each school. I wept. Because, of course, I know that app developers like to make money and 
be, have food and a roof over their heads. So I respect that apps cost money. But for the purposes of the prototype of the pilot project, we decided to run with this. This method is often used at schools and universities where you do have shared iPads or a classroom set or one department where they have a pool of iPads uh, where they all need the same apps. And this works to a point where automatic downloads lets you, works for up to 10 devices. So if you download it with an Apple ID on one iPad, it downloads it on nine of them. But when you're pushing that out to 35, that's, you're definitely pushing the boundaries of what is acceptable. But then this, of course, led to challenge number three. Because we weren't buying individual licenses of the apps, it wasn't really an option to use an MDM because that requires you to have those individual licenses purchased for every device you're pushing it out to. So it wouldn't really allow it. The decision was made again for the purposes of the pilot project that we wouldn't be managing or supervising the devices. So again, it came down to the devices they got, it would have been the same as if they'd gone down to a shop, which didn't, there's no Apple stores in Fiji, um, if they'd gone to a shop and bought it themselves. I told you this wasn't gonna be a typical iPad deployment talk. Uh, but we pushed on. We had the hardware. We set up the, it was a beautiful day when all these devices got wheeled into our office. Um, not quite as impressive as the 15,000 we saw the other day, but still took up a considerable amount of room. We had the hardware, we set up the wireless network, everything was set up on the ground uh, we, before we left. Um, set up all the devices, talk to each other, loaded all the apps we wanted onto one device, and then set up the rest of them from an iTunes backup from that original one. On the ground, it was supposed to be a simple matter of plugging everything in, and it was all work. That was the dream. The lead up to pro the project before we left was very stressful because we actually knew very little about what was going on, uh, what, what to expect when we found, what to, found, what to expect to find when we got there. We were prepared as best we could with, with the hardware, the software, the training plan, and our best problem solving skills and thinking hats. So finally the day came and off we went to Fiji. Myself, an academic from my apartment, from my department, and two people from Rotary, the on-the-ground program coordinator and one of their exchange students who was coming along as our photographer. So that's the island of Taviuni there. Usually if you're flying into Fiji, you'll go into Nandi or Suva on the big island there. And Taviuni is the third biggest island. Fiji's made up of, I think, 332 islands. And Taviuni is the third biggest one. And it's got a population of about 20, 22,000 people. Most of the island is only sort of populated around the edges, and the yellow thing in the corner is what we got when we asked for a map of the island um, with interesting points of interest, such as good birding, um, which is relevant, but with the schools and everything pointed out. And, okay, I know what you're thinking. When you tell people you're going to Fiji for work, everyone kind of rolls their eyes and, yeah, 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 work, kind of wink knowingly. But it, it wasn't all lying in the sun drinking from coconuts. Uh, the reality was a bit different. <laughs> I love that this was actually a sign. Um, so somehow we managed to get all the ha hardware to the island itself, and that was a challenge in itself. So that was most of one classroom set, and so it was about two times that. So all up, we were taking 70 iPad minis, two Mac minis, two keyboards, two mice, two external hard drives, two Airport Extremes, two Apple TVs, and two large displays, and all the other sorted charges and cables and dongles. Um, we took the iPads out of the boxes and just used a lot of bubble wrap because otherwise it wasn't gonna work. Uh, we also had two of these things. So this is a DIY charging crate. And this was actually a rather ingenious solution to what on the surface would seem like a pretty simple, would have a simple solution in the perfect world. How do you charge 35 devices? A proper commercial charging crate, there's a few of them out there, they will set you back a few thousand dollars easily. And that was money that was not left in the budget. And so this, this is what I mean about problem solving. All this, these could be flat packed, so we had two of these. And, and we could pack it all into a suitcase, and it was made of a collapsible charging crate, two dish racks, a bunch of power boards, and a whole lot of zip ties. 
we, we were a bit careful when we were plugging everything in for, for the first time, but it was fine. We even had the issue where we didn't think about what would happen once the iPads were actually in there and the extra weight. So the bottom was starting to sag a bit. So we just put a few more zip ties al along the bottom of the crate. <laughs> <laughs> so it worked. Um, the, between, so between the four of us, so again, kind of a contrast to the photo of the 15,000 iPads, that was how we packed everything to get there. Uh, between the four of us, we had eight pieces of checked baggage for um, six of them had actually the devices and the hardware and our own personal belongings. And the, then the other two pieces were the two big screens. We were given a pile of paperwork to give to the customs officials in Fiji and just the advice to smile a lot. <laughs> so we got it all in and our flight from Nandi to Taviuni was on this beautiful plane. And we landed at an airport that looked like this. LAX, eat your heart out. <laughs> All right, so we arrived and we got things set up. And we found a few things that we weren't expecting, and which was the internet and the power were decent. Uh, both schools had a computer lab already with uh, PCs and a tech-savvy computer teacher. So that was a win. That was our setup once we actually implemented it with the rat's nest of cables, the charging crate, the TV, uh, the Mac Mini, everything sitting there. So it, was, it looked similar at both schools. Once we plugged in the magic blue cable into the Airport Extreme as well, uh, all the devices were online and that was a pretty magical moment when suddenly all these notifications started popping up on all the devices. And because there was an interesting issue as well, one of the schools, that they had set up Wi-Fi at both the schools, but one of them was this stone concrete reinforced building, so as soon as you went inside, every, nothing worked. So in the end, we just ran meters and meters of the blue cable into the classroom. At the other school, it was actually already in the computer lab, so it was really easy to just plug the, the cable into the Airport Extreme, and it worked. Um, another thing we actually did once we were there is we used a caching server to optimize actually the internet usage. As soon as one of the iPads had downloaded an app or an update from the internet, uh, all the rest of them could just pull it down from the server. Easy. So some things did actually go really easily. Um, we were amazed when we did plug everything in and it worked. Some, another thing I know you're probably all itching to ask about is security. Was well, there any? Nope. Um, because the iPads were being used as a cl shared classroom set amongst many students, there weren't any passcodes on the iPads, uh, any devices on the same network could access the shared file system that was saved to the server. And what about the security of the actual devices? Was there anything in place for that? No. Beyond the lock on the door and the vigilance of the teachers, uh, that, that was about it. We brought this issue up repeatedly, but the schools insisted that wouldn't be an issue. And partially, it is actually a very different culture, so we respected that decision of theirs. Yes, we did install Find My iPad onto the devices, but there are two slight problems with this. The Wi-Fi only models don't have a GPS chip, and so they rely solely on Wi-Fi triangulation to determine location. And somewhere like Cabiuni, you don't really have a lot of Wi-Fi available to triangulate from. And, and the other problem was you actually need internet access to be able to send that ping back of this is, this is my location. Uh, we did demo to the students how it was going to work, so in part that was kind of scare tactics of if it goes walkabout and um, but the other thing we tried to actually really ingrain was, you know, this is shared devices. We want to have these as long as possible so your brothers and sisters and cousins who come through a school can also use these. So that was what the approach we took instead. The other fact, the other thing we had working for us actually was that there's essentially no Apple products on that island. So if they took it, they wouldn't be able to charge it and they wouldn't be able to sell it because uh, everyone knows exactly where it came from. In the end, what happened was we were in Taviuni for 12 days, so it was pushed out by a couple of days. We worked many 10 to 12 hour days, including weekends, and introduced the tablets to about 50 students, uh, 50 teachers, and over 500 students across the two schools. Uh, during that, in 30 plus degree heat, uh, during that time, we also had a reporter following us around and a rotary film crew following us around, so we could make everything look very pretty as well. As you would expect, the kids took to the iPad and just ran with it, sometimes a bit too literally. Um, 
especially considering the fact that to them this was something they'd only seen in movies. They hadn't seen iPads before. I think there was one, one of the students I talked to whose father had brought him back a Mac laptop from the US. Um, other than that, that was kind of it. We focused on getting the devices into the hands of many people as possible, but with particular focus on the teachers and getting them comfortable with it. Because you can have the best apps, you can have the best deployment, but that means nothing if you don't have the teachers on board. And as you would expect, the teachers were very skeptical. Uh, this is a universal problem where you can introduce the technology, but you can't make teachers change their thinking overnight. Especially in Fiji, where it is still actually a very didactic culture, where it's a teacher at the front of the class delivering the information, and handing an iPad out to each student starts to disrupt that authority. Other problems we found were also universal. How do we keep the students from accessing content they shouldn't, and how do we keep them off Facebook? Yes, they'd heard of Facebook, and many of them were on it, because uh, they were uh, computer cafes not down the road. And so there's definitely a desire from the teachers for a greater level of control over the devices and what the students could access, and even as we explained that maybe one day they'll be able to teachers to push and pull apps. Um, because we started getting uncontrollable outbreaks of GarageBand. Um, <laughs> And even so, we did not have the heart to take off GarageBand when the music teacher said, I used to have three keyboards, now I have 35. So that's kind of one of the quotes that stuck with all of us uh, when we left. We asked some of the senior students to look for apps that they thought that would be useful. Um, and we ended up with things like this. It seems some other things are actually universal that you wouldn't expect. But overall, beyond anyone's greatest expectations, despite the hacks and the broken rules and the, the, the technology worked. By day three, the students were creating, were recording themselves, creating keynote presentations, uh, saving them back to the server and then presenting them wirelessly back to the Apple TV. And you ended up with this beautiful meta thing where they were presenting to their peers and they were videoing their presentations of their videos of themselves performing. Um, and to quote a very wise man, it just works seamlessly. So yes, we broke all the rules of deployment, but in retrospect, knowing as little as we did, it did have its benefits. These were the apps we ended up putting on, and all up we spent about $130 per school on apps. So multiply that by 70 devices, and suddenly you're looking at a different kind of budget. And you don't even know if these apps are all useful or necessary. Um, and something like this is applicable even on a large-scale deployment. If you're buying hundreds or thousands of licenses of an app, even on a volume purchasing program, that's going to cost a lot of money. And you want, so you want to be, make sure you're getting the right ones. After feedback from the teachers, and this is ongoing now as well, there, we spent the last three days on the ground sourcing more apps and then reconfiguring all the devices manually. So again, so going through and updating the settings, talking with the teachers about how do you want this to work, what apps do you want, which ones aren't useful, and then again going through creating a master iPad and re-imaging them all from the same one. We even set up things in the end because we knew we had internet that we set up a mail account so they could email from the iPad to their teachers, their assignments, and even setting up things like iCloud, so any of the notes, any, we set up photo streams, so some of that content would be available across all the devices, no matter which one you picked up. The problem still exists that there is no volume purchasing program in Fiji, but part of those ongoing discussions about the sustainability and replicability of the project is that you do have to make a budget available for things like this, for apps. It can be argued that for even such a small-scale project, would a full-blown deployment would be necessary, uh, an M MDM or something like that, because in this instance, these were shared devices, so they were, we didn't have an individual Apple ID for each iPad. They were being used as a shared classroom set. So what is actually a takeaway from all this? So what? So you have a budget, you have reliable internet connection, you have an Apple store not too far away if something does fall over, which is frankly more than we have in New Zealand. I uh, mean in terms of the Apple Store, not the internet and electricity. It's unlikely that you'll be in a situation like this. There are many places in the world like Taviuni and there's some great aid projects going on. This is a, 
um, action research project called School in the Box, based in rural classrooms in India and sub-Saharan Africa, where it's, it's, a, it's a crate and it has in it a solar blanket that powers a 12 volt lithium battery for a Pico projector and speakers, and it has an iPad 2 preloaded with apps for a curriculum. Simple, right? Now that's thinking out of the box. So I'm not saying that you have to go do an aid project. If, if you get the chance to lend your skills to an aid project, I'd highly recommend it. What I'm trying to say is the standard procedures are all good and well when you live in the perfect world. And this is actually something that's come up in a few presentations from Jamf Software and from RMIT in the previous presentation of, it's also about making sure the end user has a good experience. That it's, these are users' devices that, so in my line of work, I'm used to dealing with the end user and their frustrations with things getting locked down. So it's about considering the user and what you can enable them to do and empowering them rather than controlling or restricting them. Again, think of the charging crate, a thing of beauty, where it's not the prettiest solution, but it works. They say that shoestring budget forces ingenuity and that we're the most creative and constructive when we have constraints. Solutions come as a result of problems. The beautiful MDMs and software we have in place only exist because at one point it was a, solu at one point it was a problem. As, as they keep saying from Jam Software, if, if there's a problem, file, go to the forum or file a bug or something because that's how we get solutions. So at one point it was how do we manage devices in education and enterprise and that led to some of the solutions we have now. So think about that next time you are faced with some kind of implementation challenge. So finally, I was trying to finish up in time for questions, which didn't seem to work. Uh, but these are some of the challenges we uh, these are some of the challenges we faced on this project. And I don't mean this rhetorically when I say, what would you have done differently? So feel free to talk to me afterwards. You are the people that are better informed, better informed about these things. So what would you have done when faced with these kinds of problems? You, uh, there are going to be more digital learning rooms. Rotary plans to set up another, their goal is to set up 100 of these in the next three years. And so these ones are definitely a pilot project and there's room for improvement in version 2.0. Vinaka Vakalevu, thank you.